guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is, uh, John Schnepp. Oh, I mean, my mistake. Uh, uh, John Gambia. <laughs> Greetings and salutations, everyone. The best damn movie related show coming to you from right here at the Co Colombian? No, Philippines? Oh. No, from the Collider Video Studios <laughs> here in Burbank, California. And we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here, John Schnepp. Harvey, tell the truth. <laughs> tell the truth. You had one job. Just go <laughs> yeah, on. You, say it. You had say it. one job, Steve Harvey. Also, you're Christian Harloff. You poor, poor bastard. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that was so hard to watch. We just uh, watched it. So that was so if, if I feel so bad know, for Steve Harvey. If you don't know what it is we're up here jabbering about, uh, uh, so like, I guess last night was the Miss Universe competition. Uh, and it's being hosted by Steve Harvey, who is one hell of a funny yeah. man. He's and a great he's, host. And a great host. He, we love Steve Harvey. He is great and he's hilarious. But you had one job. Yeah. Mm. He. So if you did, have not heard about this, it comes down to the final two: is Miss Columbia and Miss Philippines. And Steve Harvey comes on stage. He is the winner and new Miss Universe is. Miss Columbia and all uh, the, the confetti so falls and put the crown on her head. She's he, waving for like two minutes <laughs> on stage. <laughs> he read. I'm gonna go watch The Force Awakens. Yeah. He read the wrong name. He uh, read the wrong. And we're all just sitting here watching it just now. It's like, yeah. oh my god! He comes yeah. back on stage. <laughs> He's like, uh, I'm no, sorry, what? but uh, the uh, the real winner is uh, Miss you know, What Philippine. happened? He was, he was talking. He was like, man, that Columbia is hot. You know what? I'm gonna give it to her. And then he went back, and they go, you can't do that. Yeah. Like, it's just so I'm awkward. Sorry. Now they gotta yeah. they gotta go over to poor Miss Columbia and take the crown oh, off yeah. her yeah. head and give it to you know this Saturday Night Live is going to eat this. Oh, absolutely! Everyone's eating it up. This is crazy. So embarrassing. All right. Okay. Well, this is, of course, Collider Miss Universe talk. And now, okay. let's talk about some movie stuff. Ashley, right. what's going on? It's Monday, which means it's time for our weekly box office report. Brought to you by our friends at AMC <laughs> Theaters. Everybody in the board's like, thanks, John, for spoiling Miss Universe. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Oh, Spoiler alert. That's really great. Right, well, parents are crazy. <laughs> he gets spoiled. For right. the second time this year, the all-time opening weekend box office record has been broken. Earlier this year, Jurassic World beat out the first Avengers movie by making $208 million. Now, Star Wars The Force Awakens has beaten that by $30 million dollars taking in just over 238 million coming in a distant second place is the new alvin and the chipmunks movie making 14.4 million dollars in third spot is the new tina fey amy polar comedy sisters which made 13.4 million dollars in fourth spot is the hunger games mocking jay part two being knocked out of the number one spot for the first time in five weeks and making an additional 5.6 million and a worldwide total of 595 million dollars rounding out the top five is the seventh film in the rocky franchise Creed making just over five million dollars. Schnepp, what stands out to you about this week's box office report? Oh, I don't know. Maybe Star Wars <laughs> The Force Awakens stands out. Um, yeah, 238. Uh, there's, now they're saying it's not official yet, but it's maybe going to be 247. There's, yeah, they're speculating. There's some speculation right now that the numbers could get adjusted. Right. So like the Hollywood Reporter right now is saying 247 uh, and other people picking up in that. We're sticking for now. We're sticking with the 238 because the 238 number is what is still right, right now the official number. That's official. But by by this afternoon, by the time the show ends, they might adjust that up to 245, 247. Two, we'll have to keep our eye on it. As of right now, the official number is still 238. But I think uh, the other things that stand aside from that, and also my prediction being very almost spot on, um, is uh, sisters and and the road chip or whatever the thing's called the thing is called road chip yeah. right yeah. yeah that they actually made a 14 million each that's surprising i mean i think that's spillover that's it's counter absolute spillover. that's it counter programming where you went to the theater thinking that you can actually get into this sold out movie and you brought your family and you couldn't get in so you had two other movies to pick from you had the chipmunk movie or the the tina fey amy puller movie so that's why it's so even too it's so weirdly even it's like they're less than 1 million dollars yeah, apart it's just like that just spillover so I mean, that, that stands out to me, and it's, it's cool to see Creed hanging in there. I mean, but honestly, the Star Wars news is the biggest news. It's the biggest opening ever in Christmas, and in, in I guess it's history now, history. right? History. Yeah. Biggest, biggest opening in history, and, and like you're right. Honestly, here's the thing. It's going to sound weird to say, but the biggest shock to me and surprise is Alvin and the Chipmunks and Sisters, because I'm not surprised at all by the Star Wars numbers. The fact, I, If you had told me they both would have made 
14 plus, yeah. like 28. I would have said you're dreaming. I would have mm. like I still thought it was a good idea. You remember back when they first announced this, that Alvin and the Chipmunks moved would be up, released, yeah. moved up to it. I said, hey, actually, that might not be a bad idea. Mm. But I still didn't think it would crack 10, so that's impressive. But really, look, the story here is Star Wars The Force Awakens. Um, whether it's 238, whether it's 240, 247, 250, whatever, we are talking about shattering a record. When Jurassic World came along, it beat the previous record, the, the original Avengers, by one million bucks. It beat it by one million bucks. As of right now, the new record beat it by 37 million bucks and maybe up to like 46 million bucks or, or 40 something million bucks that it beat it by, which is just crazy numbers. Also, it broke the worldwide opening weekend record. But think about this. It broke the worldwide opening week re record without opening in China yet. It no. still has to open in China. Like when Jurassic World opened and it was like the biggest opening week uh, worldwide, it had China also. This is why, and you know, sometimes people ask, John, how come when you guys do box office reports, you only talk about the North American box office, you don't talk worldwide? Because they open in different markets at different times. You mm -hmm. can only compare worldwide opening weekend numbers if all the movies are opening in the same number of markets at the same time, and they're not. So all we really have to go on is you know, the domestic box office, and that's why when we do box office reports, we do that. But it broke the international, the world, not the international record, the worldwide record without China. Right. Imagine how much it would have beat it by had China opened on I the same Lucas weekend. Lucas was right, I'll squash you like a bug. <laughs> like a bug, squash you like a bug. So anyway, what did, what did you think? I mean, well, the one thing that I found interesting also is that, you know, Hunger Games is has made about 500 million. Uh, Star Wars already did right. that. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. Yeah. And within within yeah. a couple of days, it already did that. And I do think, because listening to Bob Iger, because like, as you always say, you worship at the altar of George Lucas. George Lucas I I'm do. worshiping at the altar of Bob Iger. From what this guy has done, listening to him speak this morning on Bloomberg and and watch like the fact that he says that the projections are going to be 247. I'm pretty sure it's going to be 247. And when you look at what that movie has accomplished and all the records that it has, smashed, it could go as high as 247. As 247. Yeah. Now for me. I and being the Star Wars guy that I am, I was the I was the, the one of the biggest doubters. I didn't even know it was going to cross two hundred million because of be, and it being in December and you know Christmas time. I, I was beyond wrong on that. You were super close. If it turns out to be two forty seven here, and I think that everything that this movie has done, and I think that the drop off next week is going to be maybe even smaller than we thought because we had spoken about a lot of people didn't get tickets opening weekend and yeah. uh, and are waiting for the rush. I I'm very curious to see what week two is going to be like. But yeah, Road Chip to me, I think, is a more bigger surprise to me than Sisters because Road Chip is one, like, I think that when I, I took my, my daughter to see it, that's why I look like I'm 87 years old right now, <laughs> I have to endure it. But, it. but I took my daughter to see it, and there were a lot of kids in there, younger kids that maybe can't see Star Wars yet. Um, but that, I'm gr glad Creed's hanging in there for sure. That, that to me, is it's, it's just, it's kind of doing not the same type of business as what Kingsman did. But they just started doing a new marketing push for Creed as well. Yeah. And do you notice they're doing a secondary push right now to get more people to it because it deserves to have an it, it audience? It does. And the fact, I, I like that, that it's sticking in there in, in number five. So um, this was a really big weekend for Star Wars fans, for movie fans in general. And I think something interesting that Bob Iger said was they saw a spike. In, I think the next day, in, as far as movie tickets went, because when they when they originally sold all these tickets, they saw a big increase in guys. A lot, a lot of men were going to see Star Wars, but then when the word starts to spread about Daisy Ridley, and uh, then more women started. They saw their women demographic go up as far as ticket. Share. So I think to me that is going to be something really big that continues throughout the run of Force Awakens. Yeah, and that's JJ. He's one of the principal guys. Who was like, I, 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 he really pushed the to have a, a female be the lead. Yeah, he said that's really important to to do this new Star Wars trilogy. I think that's the way to go. She was so good, man. She was amazing. Man. So here's something really interesting and scary. It's interesting and scary to keep in mind. Unlike Jurassic World, when it came out, its opening weekend box office surprised everybody, including uh, Colin Trevorrow, including all the people in your, nobody expected Jurassic World to have the opening weekend right, that right, did, right. nobody. So what you had was you had everybody who wanted to see it just went to the theater. There was a new dynamic at play here with movie going this weekend because of how many people did not go just assuming they couldn't get tickets. I mean, there were, I know tons of people, you know people, you, we all know people who like wanted to see Star Wars this weekend, but did not because they operated on the assumption you ain't gonna be able to get near a movie theater. 
this weekend. I because Dennis had had this one conversation with somebody at the theater. I went and talked to to some of the guys over at the uh, AMC Burbank 16. The people who work there. And they said, there are still lots of our screenings are not sold out. But what you have is, because the weather hasn't been great here for, for Los Angeles. Um, it's, it's been okay. But, you know, people, generally speaking, they don't want to go and stand in line for three hours. And they didn't want to go to the movie theater to try to buy tickets because they assumed it would be sold out. So they said, I mean, all of our theaters are, are pretty much full, but almost all of our screenings still have some seats available. What we don't have any seats available for is the one theater they have that has pre-assigned seating. That one sold out like throughout the weekend, every single screening into the week because people didn't have to wonder if they were gonna get tickets. Right. They didn't have to wonder where their seats were gonna be. And the, I was talking to one of the guys over at the Burbank 16, they said, if all of our theaters were pre-assigned seating and people could pre-buy their seat and pre-select their seat, he said the amount of business, we would have probably had about 30% more business. Yeah. Think about that. Think about the number of people that went to go see Star Wars and how much more it might have been. It's true. This is a crazy phenomenon. Well, look at the repeat viewings as well, too. We had always talked about this here on our Jedi Council. Right. It, it depends. The amount of money this movie's going to make is how good it was. And I think for it, it has gone from good to a lot of people's minds to great to a lot of people's minds as well, too. And not a lot of, not a lot of uh, oh, that was terrible. I haven't heard terrible. A couple heard, of weirdos. I've heard, yeah. weird, but I've heard some people saying, like, oh, disappointed. Fine, but that's not terrible. And so right, we're at a good and a great level from a lot of people. And I know people that have seen it three to four right. times already. I'm going to see it three to four times. Yeah. And we're only we're not even out of week one. So once we get to once more people are seeing it for I, and I keep getting tweets, I'm going to go see it a fifth and a sixth and a seventh time. That's going to continue to happen with the hardcore fans and brand new fans that are coming in, too. That there are people you got to remember the new generation that is learning about Star Wars now or being introduced to Star Wars through this movie. They're going to see it a bunch more times. Remember when we were younger and we were telling our our parents, I gotta see it again. How many times did you see the original one? Yeah, so yeah, many times. So many times. And as a kid, this is the first time I it was the coolest thing ever. I saw it for a second time yesterday. I was walking out and I saw these two little kids. They must have been like, I don't know, eight years old. And they're like, Well, wait a minute. Do you think there'll be a ten, an eleven, and then a twelve? Um, I gotta see this one again because and uh -huh. you hear these two kids talking, I'm like, that that's awesome. That's exactly what you want. Those kids, those two kids I saw are going to be seeing that movie a ton of times. Yeah. Now one one of the things this is gonna sound weird. This is gonna sound weird. Um we had talked about on our view, you, me, and Tiff, we talked about this on Jedi Council, actually, about does Star Wars The Force Awakens have a chance to catch Avatar for the all-time record? Yeah. These numbers actually convince me even more that it will not. It won't catch it. Um, because if, if you look at it this way, I mean, who knows what will happen? I mean, crazier things have happened. It might. I hope it kind of does. But if you look at it, um, Star Wars The Force Awakens has just beat... Jurassic World's opening weekend box office record by 15%. By 15% of beat it by. So if you extrapolate that, uh, I think Jurassic World ended up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.7 billion worldwide. So if you extrapolate that 15% bigger in the long term and that maintains long term, then you're looking at The Force Awakens making two to 2.1 billion. Can it pick up that much more steam to add another 30% on top of that 15% and cross the $3 billion line to beat Avatar? I still think that's a dubious proposition. I still, I still don't think it will. I think it has a real chance to catch Titanic for number two, but I still don't think it's going to catch Avatar because to me the math doesn't line up at this point unless a new phenomenon comes. But you're still feeling pretty confident that it does have a real shot at catching Avatar. 100%. Uh, 100%. 100%. Like, you're going to be shocked if now it doesn't catch Avatar. I, at, at, one point, at one point I was like, I think it could. I think it's going to do it because I get the math. But the difference is Jurassic World is not Star Wars. I said, no, this is uh, true. And it doesn't have that repeat no, viewing. No, because We've everybody, already, all of us have already seen it twice. Yeah. And we're looking forward to seeing it a third Did time. Did you hear of anyone that saw Jurassic World two or three times the opening weekend? Nope. No. And, and the thing, but and, I did for Avengers. And Avengers, Avengers has comparable numbers it, to Jurassic World. It does. World. Avengers, I think, is a, is, a, is a comparison for sure. But I think that also Star Wars... And the Avengers did phenomenal business. But I think Star Wars, again, for what... And Dennis said it earlier, too, because it's got this thing of people going... It's not 
it, you, it's such a different feel from the prequels. It's just so different that it takes you back to the original trilogy that it's you're recapturing that kind. Of, it is recapturing that magic again, and I think that's why it's going to all do all this repeat business. And jumping back to what we just said before, not everyone has seen it yet. In that second week, you're going to see I, I, the drop off is really what I'm, I'm curious about. So I want to see what that second week is like. If we get like a really big, let's say this, the final numbers for this weekend is like two forty five, right? Sure. And next week, let's say it makes 150 to 160 next week. Right? <sighs> if that does that, if yeah. it does that, then I think we have a good shot. Well, I, I look, I said this before, I'll say it again. I believe the second week drop off is going to be around the 30% range. I think it's going to be around the 30% range. I think it is more than realistic to expect that we're going to see a second weekend. Wrap your head. How many movie theaters, how many studios would kill to have a movie open with a $150 million weekend. Everyone. I'm thinking Star Wars The Force Awakens is going to have a second week. And you still don't, even with that. And even with that, you don't think it can catch up? Three Avatar. billion is a really China hasn't seen big, it yet. I know, but you're talking, China maybe will add like 90 to $100 million to the box office. Three billion is a really there's we're talking about you think only 100 million in china put it this way for, at all I, yeah i think i really? think maybe, maybe around 100 maybe at the most 150 i think the record right now in china is like a 90 million dollar thing is, is, is the current record okay. but i mean think about it this way only i think correct me if i'm wrong correct me if i'm wrong i, I believe only like 15 movies in history maybe 17 or 18 have made one billion dollars worldwide, right? That's 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 all it's ever happened. Right. Like that many times has any movie made one billion dollars? We're talking about taking the biggest movie of the the year and adding that billion dollars on top of it. Right. It's it would be amazing look i'm not going to sit here and say i will you know uh, you, you know I'll, I'll shave my head or dye my hair pink if it if it did i think it, it's certainly within the realm of it's feasible yeah i it's just three billion man is a really big number i think it's more than possible to do when you think about transformers four broke a billion and that's a piece of garbage. garbage i mean but that just had the, a lot of people going to see it because they're selling toys right now star wars is also selling toys but it's actually a really fun film and word of mouth right now is people are not only wanting to see it a second time, but a third time and bringing their friends. So it's gonna, it has that phenomena that the original 1977 Star Wars has where it's actually bringing people back into the theaters where nowadays we live in a world where we can see any movie we want and are on our own like giant screen television at home. And we have streaming Netflix, we have all this other, we have all these choices and this is a film that's dragging people back right. to the theater because it's a theatrical experience and that's and it's a really fun film. I mean, there's a couple people who are complaining about it, but I- Minority you know, though. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, honestly, it's really like a really fun, exciting film to see in the theater. You know what it also is too, going back to let's say Jurassic World and The Avengers, the two examples from <laughs> earlier, both summer movies. Um, both had other big summer movies start to chip at it after a mm -hmm. bit. It, besides Kung Fu, Kung Fu Panda 3 and a couple other things, there's not a lot that's going to be chipping at right. Star Wars until Batman vs. Superman. There'll be other things that, that can certainly take money away from it, but not at the impact of, say, a summer yeah, movie Deadpool. does. Deadpool. There's a couple of good February. Dead, but even Deadpool. that's a long way away. That's, 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 that's a long that's way away. I'm saying up until, let's say, Deadpool. Okay, so Deadpool, even because it's a rated R film as well, too, they'll probably and, and the same, same audience, for sure. But up until that point, there's not a lot that's going to be really taking so much away from it, because if you have the Avengers and, and Jurassic World, I don't remember what came out right after those movies, but I'm sure it was at least the movie that did anywhere from 50, 60, 70 million opening weekend, and that'll start to chip. So I think that that's why this December, and it's also when you look at Avatar and Titanic, both movies that came out December, January, and had that time to build, because both Avatar and Titanic didn't open anywhere close to this. They had enough time to really Oh, they keep... both opened sub 100 million. Right, they didn't right. even crack like, 100 million. Throughout your head around, Avatar opened to less than 100 million. I think it opened like movies. 75, 77 right. million dollars. Both three-hour movies, both in 3D, and this movie's in 3D as well. And I'll tell you, I saw it, I'm not a big 3D fan, but I saw this movie in 3D and I was surprised how much I enjoyed it in 3D. Yeah, it was really I was fun. kind of dreading watching it in 3D because Same I didn't here. think it was necessary. See, the one thing you raise about, and we've talked about this before, is about the fact that, you know, this is an opening in the summer, so it doesn't have, it's not gonna have the same competition around, surrounding it. That is the one exception to this, because when I think about all the other things we talk about, it's a theatrical experience, it's getting people back into the theater, it's people going back to watch it five, six, seven, eight times. Right. That was Avengers. I mean, that really was Avengers right. when, when the Avengers first came out. And Avengers ended with like 1.6 billion. We're talking about coming close to doubling 
what the Avengers did. I, I to me, it is still. I hope it happens. How much yeah. did it make worldwide this weekend? Over five hundred. Five hundred. So imagine already. next weekend it's three hundred, and the following weekend is three hundred. That we're gonna. Then it's gonna crack one billion. It's gonna what, crack one billion before the end of what's this the year. What's the fastest know, movie to ever make one billion? Done three weeks. What's the fastest movie to make? That's a very good question. I don't know. That's a, that's yeah. it. Will be this. That's, that's this the will question. be the fastest what, to hit a billion. If you guys are out doing research, what's the fastest movie to hit one billion? But I'm just saying, if it hits a billion before the end of this year, it's got all of January to soak up that other billion and a half. I think it's doable. But remember, yeah. by that point, then we're, we're getting into only repeat viewings of that. Because like after we cross three or four weeks, now we're into things where everybody's seen it, right. who's going to go see it. We'll see what that drop off is. This is going to get really, really interesting. This is a phenomenon. In the you know, it's funny. I had one people, why are you guys talking so much about Star Wars lately? It's like, that's like asking ESPN during Super Bowl week, why are you talking so much about football right now? <laughs> this is the, business-wise, this is the yeah. biggest thing we've ever seen happen in the movie business. It is an incredible phenomenon that's happening right now and now we're less than a year away from star wars rogue one so just wrap your heads around that jurassic world did it in 10 days is what they're saying jurassic did it in 10 days star wars will beat that yeah star wars absolutely beat that all right What's next? All right. The highly anticipated Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice is now just three months away, and fans are more anxious now than ever to find out as many details about the film as possible. This weekend, a report began to circulate around the web that a German theater company had revealed the runtime for the superhero team at movie. According to the reports, Batman versus Superman will come in at two hours and 31 minutes, making it eight minutes longer than the previous, previous film in the series, Man of Steel. John, is two hours and 31 minutes too long for a movie like Batman vs. Superman? Two hours and 31 minutes is long. There, there, there's no way around it. That's long. However, we got to keep this in mind, too. I don't believe, aside from comedies, I believe comedies, 90 minutes should be the target for comedies. I don't know why I, I feel that way, but for me, 90, 95, 98 you, yeah. minutes, that's the great target number for right. comedies. But for almost anything else to me, hey, two hours is an average length, two and a half hours is long, three hours is bloody long, whatever. But I've always said this, it depends on the film. It really depends on the movie. I can go and sit down and watch Lord of the Rings Return of the King, and that three hours just goes by, man. It mm -hmm. just flies. It The three-hour runtime for Lord of the Rings Return of the King was an appropriate runtime to me. That's what it felt like. So... Is two and a half hours, two hours and 31 minutes, is that a long runtime? Yes, it's a long runtime. But is it too long? I really can't answer that question until we see the movie. We might go in and watch that movie and think, you know what? This movie was almost perfect. It should have shaved about 10 minutes off. It should have mm -hmm. shaved about... Or, or we'll go in and we'll feel like when the credits roll, we'll feel like, man, that time flew. It's, so it's almost impossible at this, time, at this point until we see the movie to really say. Now, as comic book movie fans, our default position is, well, hell, I've been waiting 30 years for Batman yeah. versus Superman to be on screen. Make it five hours. I mean, we can say that. But who knows? Two hours and 30 minutes, that might be the sweet spot. Maybe we'll walk out thinking it's too short. Maybe we'll walk out wishing they, they trimmed 10 minutes out of it. I just don't feel like we can... You know, in an educated way at this point, say whether this is the right runtime for the film or not. Schnepp, you heard about the runtime. Your reaction to that? Yeah, I think it's the perfect runtime. I mentioned it. Uh, I was hoping it would be two and a half hours last week. And so if this is really the, the breakdown, then it makes sense because you're reintroducing the Batman character in this Man of Steel universe. And you're also introducing a lot of the other DC characters, but mainly it's Batman. So I think the first 45 minutes is going to feel like it's a Batman movie and him trying to figure out how to deal with this Superman character. Then they're going to introduce Superman. They'll probably see, there'll probably be like a, a little bit of Superman in there as well, but you'll start to see it really focus on Batman versus Superman in the next hour. And then a bunch of other characters will come in for the third, the third act. So it feels like if it's a natural act one, act two, act three, in a kind of a big epic way, this feels like the right runtime, especially with Man of Steel, like, yeah, you could have cut 10 minutes out of Man of Steel here and there, whatever, but it didn't, it never felt like, oh my God, I'm bored. I mean, I've been in 90 minute films and felt like, when is this piece of trash yeah, going right. to end? Yeah. Horrible. And it's like, it depends on the pacing of the film. It depends on the quality of the film. It depends on the screenwriting. You can see a 90 minute movie and it's torture. It's literal torture. Or you can see a three hour movie and you'd be like, I want to see it again. So I think that's a, it's the perfect runtime. Christian. Makes me really nervous. Um, I think that if it was, if it was either Ben Affleck or 
or uh, or like Christopher Nolan directing, I'd be less nervous. But Zack Snyder has been known for more visual stuff, and like even I, I really enjoyed Man of Steel a lot, to be honest. But I do think there was ten minutes too long, and that does, it does. And I wasn't bored, but it was ten minutes too long. I think that it, it, like you could have cut out a lot of that action stuff, like cut trimmed down some of the action stuff with the Zod fight, and had the same impact with it too. Um, so that's what I'm worried about. I mean, it's Batman vs Superman, so of course you want it if if all the details there, and like you said, if it's if it's, if it's a movie like Return of the King, where it's that epic and everything and the script is moving, all these characters are flushed out, then it could be 245 and I'd be happy. I just don't have the confidence yet in Snyder that he can do a two and a half hour movie for me. I mean, because he didn't do it in a two and a half minute trailer so far. <laughs> so so in the movie, it makes me nervous. Hey, like, come on, that Comic-Con trailer, I still say that was, the, trailer that was, was the best trailer no, I'm talking about the one. Me. I'm talking about where what they did so far at the, the end. Yeah. The last 20, 30 seconds of the most recent right. trailer has now got me like... I don't know. I don't, I don't. But I want to see. I want to see how it fits together in two thirty. Because if we can get a movie that really defines, because I agree with you, Schnepp, as far as you have to, def, you have to really develop this new Batman. Yeah. He's new to us. He's brand yeah. new to us. <clears throat> so develop him, make him care about him, and then the same thing. And because if you do all that and you fit it all together, where you're telling this great story and introducing all these new characters, a lot to put in this movie, and it's done well, then yeah, give me two thirty. It just makes me nervous. Considering that Snyder's a visual director more than anything else, I gotta say, like the the thing that that really bummed me out about that second trailer we've talked about a lot was a uh, Jesse Eisenberg's portrayal of of Lex Luthor, but I think it's a misdirect. I think that that's the outside, just like Bruce Wayne is the outside of Batman. I think that Lex Luthor portrayal is an outside. Well, that's misdirect. what I mentioned before. So. I said it, I I'm totally cool with what we saw of Lex Luthor in that second trailer, if that's the fake persona he puts on in public, I, like Bruce yeah. Wayne puts on the millionaire yeah, playboy persona, right. but behind closed doors, maybe it's different. Hey guys, look, something I, to jump back to Star Wars, we got more Star Wars to talk about a little bit later in Spaceballs and Hateful Eight, but um, I almost forgot, you know, it's Star Wars The Force Awakens opened this weekend and it opened against Alvin and the Chipmunks. And it seems weird, but did oh, you right. know <clears throat> that in 2009, <clears throat> The creators and the people behind The Simpsons, a friend of ours, Kevin Rubio, sent this in to us. The creators of The Simpsons in 2009 actually predicted that Star Wars Episode 7 will be against Calvin the Chipmunks. Here's so a shot funny. from that 2007 or 2009 episode of, uh, of uh, The Simpsons. And if you look really closely over where it says Star Wars Episode 7, the title of the movie is Star Wars Episode 7. The Apology, which <laughs> kind of felt yeah. like what The Force Awakens was. And then uh, over on the other side is Alvin and the Chipmunks getting rabies. Yeah. I would actually pay to see that movie. <laughs> yeah, too. I would go to yeah, see... That's how the Calvin. audience feels watching. Yeah. I would not see Road Chip. I would see getting rabies. Because yeah. if they did it, if they did Alvin and Chipmunks get rabies, kind of like Marvel zombies, yeah. that could be kind of fun. That'd be amazing. All right, folks. So listen, uh, now normally we take... The movies that are opening on Tuesday and Thursday and do, you know, split them up on Tuesday and Thursday and talk about what's opening that week. But we have no show on Thursday because that's Christmas Eve. So right now we're going to talk about all the films that are opening this week brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. We got four major films opening up this week. So... Tell us all about them, all Ashley. All right. First up is Concussion. While conducting an autopsy on former NFL football player Mike Webster, forensic pathologist Dr. Bennett Omalu, played by Will Smith, discovers neurological deterioration that is similar to Alzheimer's disease. Omalu publishes his findings in a medical journal. As other athletes face the same diagnosis through crusading, Dr. embarks on a mission to raise public awareness about the dangers of football-related head trauma. Next is the Will Ferrell Mark Wahlberg comedy Daddy's Home. Brad is a kind-hearted radio executive who wants to be the best possible stepfather to his wife's two children. When her freewheeling ex-husband Dusty breezes back into town, Brad's feelings of insecurity quickly develop into an inferiority complex. As Dusty demonstrates his flair for athletics, home repair, and bad boy charisma, Brad finds himself in a no-holds-barred battle <laughs> to one-up his rival and win the approval of his family. Next is the Jennifer Lawrence film Joy, a story of a family across four generations centered on the girl who becomes the woman who founds a business dynasty and becomes a matriarch in her own right Facing betrayal, treachery, and the loss of innocence and the scars of love, Joy becomes a true boss of family and enterprise in a world of unforgiving commerce. Allies become adversaries and adversaries become allies, both inside and outside of the family, as Joy's inner life and fierce imagination carry her through the storm she faces. And finally, the remake of the Keanu Reeves, Patrick Swayze film, Point Break. 
thrill-seeking criminals perform a series of daredevil stunts to steal money and gems, only to give it away to the poor and less fortunate. Training for a job with the FBI, a young recruit, Johnny Utah, suspects that only extreme athletes could pull off these heists. Utilizing his own special skills, Utah infiltrates the gang of thieves after befriending their charismatic leader, Bodhi. As Johnny experiences the rush of their lifestyle, he his supervisors fear that his loyalties are being tested. Christian, which of these films should audiences be looking forward to seeing this Christmas weekend? Well, last but certainly least is Point Break. <laughs> that is, who wants to see that movie? Come on. That movie is going to eat the biggest amount of garbage that you've ever seen. I can't even imagine. It, it could be one of the biggest stinkers box office, I think, of the entire week. So no one's going to see that. Um, now, I think if you want to go Oscar movie, I've seen both Joy and and Concussion. I think we'll Tell see. the truth. Tell the, I did. Tell I did. the I saw truth. Him, I saw them both. I saw them Which both. one is better? Tell the truth. Uh, better? I mean, as a, David O. Russell, I think that even though I still think he's... I don't understand why. Like, there's a lot... Of, not as much as American Hustle, where I thought he was taking a lot of Scorsese's tricks. He does it a couple times. I think it's a well-made movie. I think some people might be bored with it, but I, I went up enjoying it. I thought she, uh, Jennifer Lawrence was really good in it, and I thought I had a little bit more of a story. Uh, concussion to me... It didn't pull. It didn't pull punches. It it didn't. It went. In, it definitely went after the NFL. I just for me, what I th I was kind of hoping of a balance of seeing the, both the story of this guy who who went after the NFL and but he didn't. He wasn't just doing it. He was doing it to protect the players. He really was. He was doing for the science of it and to, to show what was going on. And I wanted to see his story, and I wanted to see the actual repercussions that thing that happened. And I felt like I got just way more of the story of, of the guy. When I wanted to see a little bit more of, of a balance, so um, I it was a great performance, good movie. Same thing with Joy. I think that I like. I probably send you to see Joy, and I do want to see Daddy's Home uh, because I want to see their chemistry. And the other guys was really good between Wahlberg and Farrell. So I'm curious to what the comedy is like. It looks predictable, but I still looks like I can get a lot of laughs out of it. Yeah. So yeah, um, Daddy's Home. I haven't seen Daddy's Home yet, and the thing is. I'm a big fan of Will Ferrell, and I'm a big fan of Mark Wahlberg. I did not like their chemistry together no. in the other guys. I thought Samuel Jackson and Dwayne The Rock Johnson were the I best wanted to part. See I, that don't yeah, that. I wanted to see I don't that movie. That. That's the movie I, I wanted. I wanted to see the <laughs> other other guys. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. the one I wanted to see. Um, Joy... I'm going to. I'm a little disappointed with it, just because my expectations for these for these David O. Russell, Bradley Cooper, Jennifer Lawrence movies have become so high um, that I. It was good, not great. It was it was good, yeah. not great. It certainly wasn't on the level that we've come to expect. Yeah. So, I mean, if somebody asks, "Hey, do you think I should go see it?" I say, "Yeah, go, go see it, absolutely." But I just it doesn't live up to what they're. No other one's, one's really likable in the movie except Joy. Yeah, yeah. And but here's the thing: I have also not seen Point Break, and nobody has. <laughs> Why? Because see, they did have they had scheduled some press screenings for uh, for Point Break. And then a few days before the press screenings were supposed to happen, and they started realizing how awful their movie was. I heard the movie just got sick. Yeah, yeah, the, the, movie, the movie, movie got sick. sick. I was like, I, I got a chest cold. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I can't, I, you can't yeah. see me today. Can't see me. Yeah. Yeah. An yeah. email that gets sent out to like hundreds of journalists saying, oh, uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, we are no longer able to offer uh, the press screens. Unfor yeah, we didn't see it coming that our movie sucked. Uh, and, you know, and I'm one of the guys. I'm one of the guys who went... Hey, look, yeah, I love the original Point Break. I think it's brilliant, but I think a new incarnation of it could be pretty cool, depending on how they do it in a modern, extreme sports context. This could be all right. I have zero hope for this movie anymore. After seeing how the studio itself is treating the movie, I have zero hope for I, it. I have a buddy that went to the premiere of it and saw it, and he is a hardcore original Point Break fan and went in pretty much like that. I, I think it could be cool today. And he just said it was one of the worst things he had seen oh. in a very, very long time. Really? And he's a big, and he's a big fan. And, he, and he's a lot more forgiving than I am. Wow. <laughs> he's more forgiving yep. than I I'm am. I'm glad you picked that Man, up. That was the one I was looking for. I was going to say, I can't wait to see Point Break until you just mentioned your I, I, thought, I have actually been excited All for All the squirrel it. suit yeah. stuff. I was like, it's got to be better than Krampus. But now you're saying. <laughs> oh, no. I think Krampus looks like uh, oh, Citizen Kane. Oh, next no. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, the, the two movies I'm looking forward to most this holiday, the Christmas uh, opening, aren't on this list. It's The Revenant and Hateful Eight. Those are both opening in limited release. Very limited. Very limited. Yeah. So if you're one of the lucky people in like the three states that's playing it or the four states playing it, go see those movies. But then 
Third on the list, I want to see Daddy's Home. That's the one that out of all these makes, it's like, I just want a good film that will make me laugh. The night before was hilarious. I want another comedy, so. All right, folks, well, it's that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, for those of you watching us live, and there are a lot of you watching us live right now, we're going to save a little time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. How do you get one on? Simple. Make sure you're following us at Collider Video on Twitter and tweet into us a question. You're going to want to suck up to Ashley a little bit because she's the one who's going to be picking them out. So we're going to get to those in just a little minute. Uh, for now, let's get to the mailbag question. So Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Dan writes, hey guys, I love all the shows and I just had a quick question. Now that we've seen episode seven, who do you think Del Toro will play in episode eight? Based on his interview with E.T. back in September, I'm guessing that he'll play a bounty hunter of some sort. Who do you guys think he'll play? <clears throat> uh, bounty Hunter's not a bad call. I love that call. Yeah, not a bad call. But also, like, without going into spoilers, we didn't see a lot of the infrastructure of the First Order in this movie. We don't right. see a lot of what the inner workings of it are. I mean, I don't believe that Hux is the head of government or even closer. I think he's one of the guys. He's a general. Should you warn all those, the sweaties out there? Like, if we if we start getting into spoilers... No, we're not. We are we're not, not going to get just, into spoilers. But people, they get super weird. Like, if you conjecture something that they... I didn't see the movie yet, and you're conjecturing off of seeing the movie. It's right. like... Well, so... Um, so my conjecture uh, would be he could be a First Order government guy, a high-ranking um, you know First Order guy. Bounty Hunter's not a bad call. Um, other than that, it's a, it's literally a universe of possibilities. So I, I don't know. What about you? I love the idea of Bounty Hunter because um, I'd like to see... Basically, just take the same guy he was in Sicario and bring it over to the that Star Wars universe. Great. I'm telling you, it would be amazing. And I'd, just, I'd love to see some more Bounty Hunters in the Star Wars universe for sure. But I'd also like to... See, I, I'm, I'm also hoping and praying that Admiral Thrawn will show up who is a character <sighs> yeah right Admiral, yeah. he would be great Admiral Thrawn so um, but yeah I think that's easy there's somebody in the first order government some, he's going to be menacing mm -hmm. I think he's going to be someone that's oh, yeah, really going to cause some problems for sure so either one of those I'd be okay with I'd love to see him in the charge of another planet, but be like a reverse Lando, like an actual evil dude. So I mean, a reverse gets, Lando, yeah, I like, like that. he's like you know he's kind of like inviting and stuff, but he's actually like going to flip it on everybody and like throw everybody. That's awesome too. Let's know what cool. do you guys think? Who do you think? And who would you like to see Benicio del Toro playing? What kind of character do you think is going to be? Drop your theories in the comments and in uh, in the chat board there. All right, what's next? Michael Hamilton writes, Hello, Movie Talk crew with Star Wars The Force Awakens making a killing at the box office. Do you believe Mel Brooks when he says that Spaceballs 2, the quest for more money, could happen? Thanks, and may the Schwartz be with you. Yeah, this has been running around for a couple of days now. That Did you hear? I had people, did you hear that Mel Brooks said they're going to make Spaceballs 2? And I got all excited, and then I looked into it, and no, he didn't. He didn't actually say they were going to. What he did was, I believe he was doing an interview on a podcast, and he said something along the lines of, hey, if I was going to do one, I would do one so it would come out just like a couple months after the new Star Wars comes out. Can you imagine how much money that would make me first weekend? Like kind of joking around about mm -hmm. it. I got no indication from him that he's actually doing it and I would love it. But you know, we were sitting around the staff table this morning and we were talking about this and doing Spaceballs 2, well, I always wanted to see one, the search for more money. It, it becomes difficult. Why? Joan Rivers has passed away. Uh, John Candy is, is tragically no longer with us either. Rick Moranis doesn't do much. He, he, I mean, that by his choice, he doesn't, he doesn't seem all that interested in doing. He doesn't a lot of understand acting. sequels. He's like, why are you doing the right. movie again? Yeah. It's like, well, I, I, all right, forget it. You know, and you know, he's just, he said, you know, he did a recent uh, interview about two months ago where he said, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to acting at some point when I f find something that you know that appeals to me. But right now, he doesn't seem like he's chomping at the bit to do it. And like to me, you can do a Spaceballs two, and okay, you can do it without Dot. And okay, maybe you could do it without barf. You gotta have Dark Helmet though. And it's gotta be Rick Moranis. I mean, I mean, it's just that. It would be great to have Lone Star in there too. Maybe Lone Star has to go out and find his Winnebago. I don't know. Is Daphne Z Z Zuniga or Zuniga? She's, she's still, still around? around. Yeah. She's still doing stuff? Okay. So, I mean, that's, but, um, but going back to the thing is that he didn't really say they were doing it, so I don't believe. Sadly, 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 I don't think we're ever getting a Spaceballs 2. What do you think? I don't think we're going to get it, but if we do, 
and it's not saying this is the way that I think that I'd want to see it done, but this is the way it's going to happen if they do it. It's going to be a complete spoof of The Force Awakens. Right. It's going to have brand new comedic actors in it as well, too. They'll replace, they'll put someone in as like the BB-8 type character. And whether or not they can get Rick Moranis, they'll just put somebody in as a new they, Kylo Ren type They already character. got Bill Hader did the voice of BB-8. Right. They already right. got an SNL. That's true. So, but I mean, they, <laughs> so they, they could do one for sure. Mel Brooks could do one with brand new Comedic, young comedic actors now um, and not because the thing is as much as I agree with you that Dark Helmet is is the, he's the guy he's the one that made that movie so funny it's a generational movie as well too it certainly holds up for a lot of people if they went and they went and they watch a movie they can experience how funny it is but I think that most people are our generation that if you may, if you wanted to do it again and wanted to spoof it's basically a remake they, they remake it but the, with the force awakens mm, right. you could do that you could do that with brand new comedic actors but would people be interested in it it depends on who you got yeah. it depends on the comedic actors cuz this but, style of comedy isn't ex isn't really in style right you're now right. It you know? so, so it's it's a tough proposition I say chuck in a couple of musical numbers Sarah Silverman should be the new dot get Josh Gad as the new barf just throw in a bunch of really funny people and the farce awakens, bam, you got money. Make it for under five million bucks. Money, Mel Brooks, there you go. <laughs> all right, what's next? Je Jessica Sims writes, hey, Movie Talk crew. Okay, first of all, I have to tell you, I haven't seen The Force Awakens yet. My theater is completely sold out all the time, so I'm hoping to see it tomorrow. So without giving anything away, I was wondering about shrinking the universe. John has said a couple of times that he doesn't like it when Star Wars shrinks the universe, but he also seems to like the idea of Snoke being Darth Plagueis. Wouldn't that be shrinking the universe too? Love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it's funny. I got a lot of people were tweeting me and asking me about that. And, and here's basically, what I would I would say that an individual doesn't shrink the universe an individual just being there and being present does not shrink the universe uh, Han Solo being in the original Star Wars trilogy and spoiler alert he's in The Force Awakens Han Solo being in The Force Awakens doesn't shrink the universe just him being him and being that character that's actually consistency that's not shrinking the universe that's consistency so to me, individual characters do not shrink the universe. What does shrink the universe is the connection between multiple characters. That shrinks the universe. C-3PO being in the prequels does not shrink the universe. C-3PO was built by Anakin Skywalker. That shrinks the universe. Um, so, like, it's, it's those connections, it's those things. Those are the things that shrink them down. An individual character in and of themselves to me, it doesn't shrink the universe. It, it, like, if Lando Calrissian shows up in, uh, in a new Star Wars movie sometime, that doesn't shrink the universe. Saying that Lando Calrissian is actually Finn's dad, that shrinks the universe. It's that connective tissue that then pulls the whole universe together and makes everything feel shrunk and smaller to me. So, for me personally, no, that one example, that doesn't shrink the universe. It's what the potential connections they're in that's the thing that might shrink the universe. How would you approach that? Question? I actually think that this particular example would expand the universe because I agree actually be, because yeah. you had this character in episode three that was briefly mentioned. So are we going to hear more about this person? Um, what happens? For, why does it connect other parts that we didn't know about before? Are there new? Yeah, let's be components? careful how we answer just because no, there's something I know. I know. It, yeah. I'm just saying. Are there new components? Like who knows? We don't know. So if if there was indeed uh, Darth Plagueis at all, I think that that to me could expand it now I do think that there are other times that you could shrink it but it also depends on how it's developed in the in the future of it sure. right didn't uh, didn't uh, Palpatine say he could create you know f you know f manipulate f yeah, yeah. yeah and not die right, right? cheap death so uh, yeah who knows if they're actually connected in the new movie uh, they some fan actually put the the themes back to back and played them and it's the same exact theme when Palpatine is talking about Plagueis as then when you see Snoke, it's the same exact theme. I don't know if that's, that's not a spoiler. That's just, that's just a fact at this point, yeah. if you listen to the music. Um, you know what? I, I don't think it shrinks the universe for Star Wars at all to connect anything. Because if you're just looking at the very first three Star Wars movies, everything is about the Skywalkers. And you don't really know it from the first movie, the, star, the very first Star Wars film. But in the second film, they connect Darth Vader to Luke Skywalker. And in the, in the third film, they connect Luke Skywalker to Princess Leia right. to Darth Vader. So in essence, the films have always been small. They've always been about a very small lineage of a family. 
the prequels did the same exact thing, and I think these new tr this new trilogy is going to also follow suit and be specifically about the Skywalker family. And uh, you'll see when you see Force Awakens. I won't say any more about that, but that's my feeling about it. I don't think that makes it small in any way. I just see that that's the story structure. All right, last mailbag question, then we'll get to the live questions. Marcus Trobadov writes, Hi guys, my friend was telling me yesterday that Disney was trying to block The Hateful Eight from playing in some movie theaters. So I guess my first question is, is this true? My second question is, why is Disney doing this? Okay, so I actually addressed this a little bit on Sunday's mailbag. So if you want to see a more full kind of thing, just check out our Sunday mailbag show. It's online right now. So the basic the situation is this. Quentin Tarantino got on the Howard Stern show the other day. Um, and, and told the story about how there's one movie theater in particular that we're talking about. It's not, Disney's not trying to block Hateful Eight out of a bunch of movie theaters. There's one theater in particular called the Cinerama Dome here in Hollywood. It's an iconic theater. You see it at the beginning of the uh, Entourage uh, title sequence whenever right. you watch that show. But it's, it's just, it's one screen in a giant dome, and the inside looks like the inside of a honeycomb. Right. I mean, it's, it's actually, really cool. It's very, uh -huh. very cool. I actually personally don't like watching movies there because I don't dig the curved screen. It throws the perspective out for me. Right. But as far as a place go, it's a super cool place to go to, especially the special events. That anyway. So it's also one of the few theaters around because there's not many in the country that is 70 millimeter equipped. And Quentin Tarantino really wanted to play Hateful Eight in that particular movie theater. And what happened was uh, he thought he had an agreement in place with the people at Cinerama Dome to play it, I think, at Christmas. Mm -hmm. But what happened was, and I talked to a couple people who are a little bit more in the know than I am, but they could be wrong too. Take all this with a grain of salt. Star Wars, even long before Lucasfilm, or before Disney ever owned Lucasfilm, Star Wars has always had very strict, very big guidelines and demands for movie theaters that want to carry their movies. Um, I remember going back to The Phantom Menace, like there's a breakdown in like the first week of release, average speaking, the uh, the movie theaters will keep 20% of the ticket price and 80% goes back to the studios. And in the second week, the studio, the movie theaters keep 30% and the rest go back. This is yeah, average, right? But I remember when The Phantom Menace came out, they told movie theaters, first two weeks of release, 100% of the movie ticket price goes back to the studio and theaters get nothing. Mm. And the theaters just wanted that popcorn money, so they just had to say, okay, no problem. So even long before Disney ever got their hands on Star Wars, Star Wars has always been a tough thing to do if you're a movie theater because it's such a valuable property and as it's proving by smashing every box office record. So my understanding was for The Force Awakens, Disney had a simple rule that applied to every movie theater. If you want to carry Star Wars The Force Awakens in your movie theater, you have to commit to a minimum five-week run. That's your minimum commitment, five-week run. And if you don't, then you can't show our movie in that theater. Now, this isn't a situation like them saying, if you don't show our movie in your theater, you can't show it in any of your theaters. So it's like, I think the AMC 6 over here is not showing The Force Awakens. But that doesn't mean the, the AMC Burbank 16 can't show it. But by showing it, the AMC Burbank 16 commits to a five-week run. The same rule applies to the Cinerama Dome. And so basically what Lucasfilm told them is, look, if you want to show Star Wars The Force Awakens... You got to commit to keeping it in there for five weeks. Well, it's also the arc light because it's the arc light which owns the Cinerama Dome. Right, the arc light owns them, but they're yeah. saying if you want this in the Cinerama Dome, you have to commit to running it there for five weeks. It's the same rule we're applying to everybody. So if if you want it, great. If you don't, fine. But you can't just take it and play it there for two weeks and then pull it. You can't do that. You got to play for five weeks or don't take it at all. And that left. A real unfortunate situation because there's an emotional connect connection there between um, uh, Quentin Tarantino and that theater. You know, he's grew up in L.A. That theater means something to him. And he really wanted uh, Hateful Eight to play in there. But Cinerama Dome had a choice. We can either play Star Wars The Force Awakens or we cannot. And they just figured it would be best for business to play Star Wars. Who can blame them? The box office numbers are proving it was the right business decision. Unfortunately, it just created a really sad and unfortunate situation for Quentin Tarantino, who really... Now, look, playing in the Cinerama Dome or not is not going to make or break Hateful Eight. It's one movie theater. But I still feel bad for the dude because it's a theater that meant something to him, that he really wanted his movie playing in, and the circumstances of it just don't seem to allow now, it. Now, here's, anyway, here's what I heard. I heard that 
you tell me because if you you talk to some people about this that it's since it's the arc light that owns the cinerama dome it's not exclusively the cinerama dome but it was also all the other theaters the chain itself of arc light that disney said if you don't let us play it in the cinerama dome we'll pull star wars from all of your arc light theaters now is that right. the truth here's here's what happened so I and on mailbag, and I just talked to somebody yesterday after I had done this is after I had done mailbag. I said when I did my mailbag thing, I have a hard time believing that because I don't think you can do it. And number two, number two, Disney wants Star Wars: The Force Awakens playing in ArcLight theaters. ArcLight is not one of the five biggest movie distributors or movie exhibitors in the country, but still, it's a very prominent yeah. theater in the Los Angeles area, especially. Yeah. You want the movies playing there. But also, like we said, you know, it's not playing at the AMC 6, and yet they're playing at the AMC 16. So I, I never believed that for a second. I don't, I, I think somebody misled Quentin Tarantino. Okay. Uh, I, I don't, I think somebody misrepresented the situation to Quentin Tarantino because I just don't see how you can, <clears throat> number one, legally do that. Number two, how that makes business sense. Right. But anyway, I talked to somebody yesterday, and they said that the closest that comes is if you try to show Star Wars in the Cinerama Dome and you pull it in two weeks. We're, we're pulling it out of everything. We're, we're going to, you know, uh, uh, enforce the rules on you. If you if you play in Cinerama Dome and then pull it, we're going to pull Star Wars out of all your theaters if you break the rules. These are the rules. Do you want to play in Cinerama Dome or do you not? It was their choice. It was Cinerama's choice, and they chose they wanted to go with Star Wars. So I don't know. What, what have you heard? I mean, basically what you're saying here, but too, I mean, I understand why, I do understand why Tarantino is upset, though, because more of the nostalgia feeling of it and the fact that he's he, he grew up here he was hoping to show his movie here it's one of the few theaters that shows in 70 millimeter as well too so to be able to to be able to do that and then it being you know and and normally in december when tarantino has a movie in december he's the talk of december mm -hmm. he's not the talk of december this time around and i it's probably and, and he's an ego guy he always has been and that's why his movies are so good is because that's what, that's what he does he, he runs with his big ego and then he delivers every single time so he's probably he's probably a bit uh, hurt and i think that for him you know do i i do understand the stance although i also understand the stance of, this is the deal that we made you can't renege on the deal um, but I also think Quentin Tarantino is going to be just fine because he's probably going to wind up winning another screenplay uh, award for this one as well. So, well, you know, it's like I saw Hateful Eight. I think it's a great film, yeah. and it needs to be seen in seventy millimeter. It's made for seventy millimeter. In fact, the very beginning it says Cinerama Dome, in the very oh, in okay. Cinerama on, in the screen on the film. So, to see that he's not going to be able, I think they should just push the release. Is what I would say. Like. I think that they did a little bit though too. I know they were gonna do very, very limited in December, like right. super. And then I, and then they even pushed like they pushed even more into January because I think the real big wide is like is the first week of January. Yeah, I guess. I mean, you know, hopefully after Star Wars makes its five week run, which we're into the second week already, maybe by the you know middle of January they could play Hateful Eight at the Cinerama Dome and make a real real premiere of it. It is weird, like though you know it's like these kinds of contracts though happened so many months ago. Like right. this deal yeah. that ArcLight and Disney made, maybe Quentin just got wind of it. I was like, what do you mean it's not playing? And so that's why he got so upset. But this had to have happened like months and months ago when the tickets went on sale, like over two and a half months ago. You know, so it is kind of a weird situation. But here's the thing too. I'll, I said this on Mailbag. I say it here too. If there's a there's a huge if that floats here. If. Disney did do what I believe is legally impossible for them to do. But if they did, and if they went to, say, Arclight and said, we want our movie in this one particular theater in Los Angeles, Cinerama Dome, and said, if you don't put our movie in Cinerama Dome, we're not going to let your entire theater chain show this movie, which would be beyond stupid of them to do. Mm -hmm. But if they did that, I will say this, I will be very disappointed. I would be very disappointed in Disney. That's strong but, arming, yeah. yeah. That's strong arming. But there is no indication that that's actually what happened. There's just no indication that that's what happened whatsoever. I don't even think they're capable of doing that. However, on this, I had a lot of people writing to me. It's like, John, why are you defending Disney when they saw my mailbag? It's like, I'm not defending Disney. I'm defending logic. If Disney put out their movie and they said, look, for every movie theater that wants to run, every movie theater, not just the Cinerama Dome, if every movie theater who wants to run this movie, you have to commit to five weeks. That's the rule. If you want to follow it, great. If you don't want a movie in your theater because you don't want to commit to five weeks, that's fine. That's your choice. And if that's the case, and then Cinerama made the decision 
that they want to back out of their deal with Quentin Tarantino and show Star Wars instead. That's not Disney's fault. That's Cinerama's decision. That's Arclight's decision. So a lot of people say, John, why are you defending Disney? Well, be, because I don't throw, I don't stick my head in the sand. I'm looking at it logically. This is, these are the facts. This is what's in front of us. And you, just because just you don't like it doesn't mean that's not the way it is. Disney's the first order and uh, Tarantino's yeah, the There resistance. you go. Yeah. All right, folks. So I said we'd save a little bit of time for your live questions. We're going to do that right now. Once again, hop on Twitter, tweet us at Collider Video, send on in your questions. Ashley's going to pick some out. So, Ashley, what have you picked out? Anthony writes, Which Oscar Best Picture winner did you not agree with? Which Oscar winner do we not agree with? <laughs> Uh, th uh, there are several. I mean, that's the great thing about movies and the Oscars is that while it is voted on by the most authoritative group, like 6,000, 7,000 members of the Academy who have worked in the industry as producers and writers and directors and, and the business people and former actors and all this kind of stuff, they're still people. And it's, that means it's going to be subjective. And the wider the voting base, hopefully that works out some of the issues. One of the biggest ones for me, though, still today is that The Matrix won best visual effects over Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Mm. To me, that was an atrocity. Really? And, and I don't like the prequels, but what they did, what Star Wars The Phantom Menace did, what Lucasfilm, what Industrial Light and Magic did for visual effects in that movie, they had some very cool visual effects in The Matrix, absolutely no doubt. The Matrix is a much better movie than The Phantom Menace, no doubt. Um, all that stuff, but just on the pure level of visual effects, what they did with the art of visual effects in that movie to this day astounds me when you consider the era that it came in. They just broke so many walls. They broke new barriers. They broke new, new frontiers in visual effects. It was insane. To me, that was a locked, easy, no-brainer. And I was working in a visual effects company at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember everybody in my industry was like, I, when they heard that, that the Phantom Menace did not win best visual effects. That, to me, just blew my mind. What are, what are some of the big ones to you? Hey, Gwyneth Paltrow, Shakespeare in Love. You're out. <laughs> uh, Saving Private Ryan. Should have won best picture. Didn't win that year. That's one. I mean, there, there was another one. I love Forrest Gump, but I still think Shawshank Redemption should have beat that one. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not as much as uh, I see, think. I believe that, too, but I don't see that as a, it, as that's, a snub. That's not yeah, as much as I see, but for me, though, I think Saving Private Ryan over Shakespeare in Love. I guess it, just in general, like <clears throat> even like you mentioned, The Matrix, I thought that should have won the you know, Oscar. I thought that was like the most important film of 1999, at, at least to me. I mean, I think uh, just off the top of my head, like there's so many science fiction films that never get nominated. And I think that's just part of the Academy where it's like it's got to be a biopic or right. some kind of drama. Right. Those are really normally the ones that like get nominated. And once in a while, once every 10 years, you get like Lord, Lord of, the of the Rings. Rings right. And I just think that's kind of that's that's just the Academy, the way that the, the, the amp is the people who vote. So for me, I'd, lo I'd love to see a, cha a sea change. I don't know when that'll happen. But. All right. What's next? David Hernandez writes, what do you guys think about Stallone in a Marvel or Star Wars film? Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be Han Solo. Well, not supposed to be. He auditioned <laughs> wow. for Han Solo. He auditioned for it. And he his. if you ever if you want to see a great story, I, I, what, I think it was on Fallon. I don't remember where he was, but uh, uh, Stallone was talking to somebody on one of the, the late night shows and was saying he auditioned, went in there, and they were just looking at him like he was, he's like, yeah, they don't like, they hate me. He's like, you, you felt the hate in the room for oh, him. God. But he, he auditioned for Han Solo. But no, I could not see him in either one. I don't really want to. I love him, but I don't think I would love to see him play like an alien or something. Just like hear Spy his Kids voice. Four. No, I just like in, in in a Star Wars, maybe in Rebels, have him be like, "Hey, kids, what are you doing over right. there? You eating those Carillion cookies again? They something out." <laughs> All right, what's next? Philip Schroeder writes: Should the box office be counted by the number of viewers instead of the money made? Nope. Uh, we've we've kind of had this discussion before because just going by the number of viewers. If you do that, you take out all the other cultural considerations that go into it. The amount of money that each ticket costs reflects a certain reality in the culture that we live in. So you can say, you know, hey, it means this much if, you know, one million people go to see this movie in 1963. 
But then if 1 million people go to see it in 2015, that actually means something different because we're no longer in an era where one movie will come out a week. We're no longer in an era where there's not 500 television stations on at home that you can watch. We're no longer in an era where there's not, you know, three major gaming consoles with 500 titles that a kid can sit at home and play. Whatever. We're no longer in an era where there's 5,000 other things demanding and calling for your entertainment dollar. And we're no longer in an era where it costs 35 cents to go to the movies. So because of all that, I believe it's actually, and when you talk to people who actually analyze the box office science who are far smarter than I am when it comes to this stuff, but one of the things they say is that it's actually quite important to take the cost of the modern day ticket into account when you're looking at box office. It's not just about how many people go, because if you just look at that number, you're discounting all the other cultural factors that go into it. I don't know, Schnepp, how do you see it? You nailed it, but the only thing I can add to that is also cost-wise, in the Midwest versus the East Coast and West Coast, tickets are more expensive on the West Coast and the East Coast. They're like roughly three to five dollars more here in LA than they are in the Midwest. And then add on top of that, something that didn't exist like even like 15 years ago was 3D, the add-on cost of like the prime seating and 3D. Right. You're talking about three to five dollars more per ticket. So you really can't do it as a like an, you can't average it out by, by a person. Also, you have to consider matinees, you have to consider kids and senior citizens. All those things equate differently like by per person or by ticket. So it has to be by ticket. Yeah, and same thing with you know, whether or not certain passes and things that people totally. get like free tickets and all those type of things like gifts and you know i guess gifts actually will go into the sales but i mean like you know if, if there's certain i know we had a card for a while that, that got us into to movies for free and, right. and even like those movie pass things after a while too like how many people get in on them so i think that the money is the best way to do it all right, what's next? John Richards writes, what was your first film memory? Mine is watching my dad laughing so hard at Lee Marvin drunk on a drunk horse. Uh, I told the story, my earliest, my earliest childhood memory is, is uh, seeing Star Wars with my mom, so that's me. Yeah, I'm the same with my, with my dad as well too, but I also remember it's, it's, it's just my dad used to crack jokes like at certain movies as well too. And I remember watching the Ten Commandments with my dad, and just like he just the it was, it was like watching Mystery Science Three Thousand with with, and he was just cracking jokes with uh, Charlton Heston. I was dying. Uh, my earliest film memory was my dad taking me to see <clears throat> on Saturdays. They had these like weekend science fiction things. I saw War of the Worlds and Pinocchio in space. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Where he fights a giant space whale. I was like blown away. All right, what's next? Mohammed Sali writes, what are Leo's Oscar chances? Um, this year? Not bad. Not bad. Uh, the you guaranteed it. Uh, at the beginning of the year before I saw <laughs> Revenant. Yes, I did. I said, this is the year. You mark my words. In like January of 2015, I'm like, you mark my words. This is the year. But then all of a sudden, along came Michael Fassbender in Jobs. <sighs> This might be another year that Leo doesn't get it. Yeah. This might be another year that Leo gives an Oscar worthy performance, but somebody else just happened to maybe be a little bit better. Uh, and Fassbender's performance in Jobs is not only was it remarkable, it's getting a lot of attention in the awards season stuff right now. So I, I'd say he's got a shot. He definitely, he's got a good shot, but. Uh, but Michael Fassbender is going to have to be something that's overcome. Three-way race between Fassbender, Eddie Redmayne again, yeah. and and Leo. And I think that for me, I actually out of my, my out of the three, I've seen all three of the movies, and my favorite was Fassbender. I thought what Fassbender yeah. did with Jobs, and and the fact that so many people didn't see the movie, you should see the movie to see what we're talking about here. He yeah. was incredible. You get away from the fact that he doesn't look like him. That dude became Steve Jobs, and he, he you were just transported. And I think, Schnepp, you, you said something every time you talk about Jobs. He was so good, and the movie was set up in a way that it wasn't supposed to tell you that much about him, but you wanted so much more from him because he sucked you in. You're like, tell me more because you're doing, like, you are Steve Jobs. And I think Leo was great, but yeah, I don't know if he's necessarily going to win it this year. And Eddie Redmayne's got a good shot. Yeah, I. Will he get nominated is my question. I mean, I think, you know, The Revenant. I feel good that he's going to get nominated. I, nominated. I feel very I mean, good he's going to get nominated. He did a great job in The Revenant. I just felt The Revenant for myself. I mean, if you're going to see one, see The Hateful Eight. I've seen both. The Hateful Eight is incredible. Revenant, it, you know, it's a very long 30-minute movie. Uh, 
Leo was great in it. I definitely think I haven't even seen Macbeth yet, and I'm trying to see that. It's not. It's only playing in such a limited amount of theaters, but that's also another role of Fastbender. I've read about him just knocking it out of the park. So maybe he'll be fighting himself. Fastbender will be nominated for Macbeth and for Jobs, but I thought he was incredible in Jobs. The movie itself isn't like I don't think the movie should win an Oscar, but yeah, like I said, I th I would love to have seen that portrayal of that character from right. Fastbender, like I'd like to see a fourth act when it was like, what, like introduce the iPhone, I'll watch that, you know. Keep so. this in mind though, if Michael Fassbender does end up winning the Best Actor Award at the Academy Awards, then we are going to get X-Men Apocalypse and a video game movie in Assassin's Creed with the current reigning defending yeah. best actor in the world. That's pretty awesome. I mean, that that's, wrap your head around that. That's pretty cool if that happens. All right, what's next? Joe writes, what's your opinion of Spike Lee? His newest film was shown only on Amazon, which is surprising. Uh, Chirac actually played in a few theaters. It, mm -hmm. it played in, in a very limited number of theaters. Uh, I had a, just the briefest of moments and an opportunity to chat with uh, Spike at uh, the Star Wars The Force Awakens premiere. Super nice guy. It was really, I told the story, he stepped on Anne's foot accidentally, and he was very actually really, really nice about it. Um, I, I have not seen Chirac. Uh, to be honest, I thought the trailers were awful. Um, I got, but I've had another friend of mine see it, and he said it was actually pretty good. Yeah. So I think I'm gonna hang at home and, and watch it over the next some sometime over the Christmas vacation. Check it out. So, uh, but other than that, I haven't really heard too much about it. What about you? Yeah. No, I've heard it's pretty good. I'm, I'm gonna get a chance to see it next week. So. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Same thing. All right. What's next? Brandon Granzow writes: Now, after seeing Star Wars: The Force Awakens, what are you looking forward to more? Episode eight or Rogue oh, One? Man, that's a tough one. Oh, episode eight. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Super looking forward to Rogue One. Very, very, very much. But, I mean, after, especially coming out of episode seven, yeah. you're totally looking forward to episode eight. Yeah, episode eight. I want, I want to know what happens next. I am I'm cannot wait for Rogue One. I'm really excited for Rogue One. The more and more that I hear about it or even think about it. But, yeah, I want to see where it goes. Now, does episode eight, when does that come out? A year and a half. In a year and a half. So it'll come out in the summer. It'll come out in May of 2017. May wow. 2017. Yeah, you know, it's. I mean, if I got to pick one, I'd say episode eight, you know, because I, I, I'm very intrigued by Rogue One, but definitely this new version of Star Wars, this new, the new blood and everything that, you know, the movie is, I yeah. couldn't say that I'm, I cannot wait to see episode eight. All right, let's take two more. All right, Anthony, I bring to beat, right? <laughs> Should we be worried we haven't heard Wonder Woman's voice? Yeah. I saw an advanced trailer. She she talks like this. No. <laughs> no. That's Wonder Woman. She's like, oh, yes. Batman and Superman, what are you doing? Right. That's what she sounds like. I've seen it already. I'm Spoilers. training to fight Rousey. That's right. I'm I, from Wonder Island. I mean, unless, 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 let's let's keep this in mind too. What if, okay, you know, there are shows like uh, on TV, like right now, like Arrow, right? Mm -hmm. When Arrow speaks, he's got like a voice mod and there does something really cool with his voice. Like, let's say in Batman v Superman, Wonder Woman, when she talks, she's almost got like an angelic kind of, some kind of something to her voice, right? And they're just trying to not let that get spoiled. If that's the case, no, no reason to worry. Let's, otherwise, it does concern me a little bit. We've heard, we've even heard the damn butler talk. We've heard right. Alfred talk. We've heard Batman, Superman. We heard Perry White talk. Some we've senator. Heard senators. Right. We've heard Lex. <laughs> we've had everybody's had lines and dialogue. They're not letting us hear uh, Gal Gadot uh, act at this point. But then again, they haven't let us hear Aquaman yet. Right. Now, they haven't shown Aquaman the trailers. We've seen a lot of Warner, but still, we haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen uh, the kid who's going to be playing the not yet transformed cyborg. And maybe it's a very tiny role, but we haven't heard him yet either. There are a lot of characters in the movie you haven't heard yet. Does it make me a little worried? Yes, but it's just just a little. Just a little. It doesn't bit. really bother me too much. I, I'm, I like the look. I've always, I've always kind of been interested in Gal Gadot. I think she's going to be a good Wonder Woman. I really do. And I think that it's one of the things I thought they did well. I don't want to see her speak too much. They're, they're together. Right. I, I get the idea that we're doing Justice League. I didn't want to see that because I know it's going to happen, but I, it doesn't bother me. I think she's going to be a great Wonder Woman. I want the net, the third trailer to be Aquaman, Flash, Cyborg. <laughs> they all have like these little lines and they'll be like, Batman v Superman. Just don't show Batman or Superman. Yeah. I think she's going to be fantastic. Um, I think that they will have her highlighted in the third trailer, but it'll probably be more so the beginning and showing her as... Diana and not Wonder Woman, and I think they're going to self-correct 
their their you know their the trailer two faux pas is what I would call it, and just like reconcentrate. It's Batman v Superman. We all know it's called Dawn of Justice. We all know Wonder Woman's in it. They're gonna fight some weird creature at the end. Now let's get back to like what is the actual central part of this film. So I think that's what trailer three will be. So all right, final question of the day. Evan Ryan writes favorite Tarantino movie. You know, you always, you're always tempted to go back to the last one you saw, but man, it's, I mean, I, I love uh, I, I, uh, Django, I, I think. Really? I, wow. I, man, I cannot believe how much I like Django it's Unchained. I mean, especially when, when you look at the filmography of Quentin Tarantino and whether you're talking about Pulp Fiction or whether you're talking about Reservoir Dogs or whether you're talking about, even Jackie Brown I think is an underrated one from him. Django and Inglorious Bastards, which I hated the first time I saw it, and then I saw it a second time, I'm like, what the hell was wrong with me that day? This movie's awesome. Uh, but there's something about, I felt like watching Django that we just saw Quentin Tarantino who had done all these different kind of, he was improving in this skill in one movie, improving in this skill in another. And to me, it just felt like Django, he brought it all together. It's what makes me, Django is what makes me super excited for Hateful Eight. Yeah. So I, right now today, even though I'm admitting there's probably a little bit of that, the last one I saw of his bias, but right now I'm gonna go Django Unchained. Ah, uh, it's a two-way tie for me. I gotta be, I gotta cheat it out. And that's, uh, I guess three way if you look at it this way, but I'd say Kill Bill Volume One and Two and Pulp Fiction. Those are those are the ones that if I had a whole list of Tarantino and I could only watch two of them, I would take the whole entire volume of Kill Bill and I'd watch Pulp Fiction. The whole bloody affair. The whole bloody affair. Other people have gotten to see it, but except for us, Um, I would. If you're going to cheat, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction are my two back to back favorite Tarantino films. But it's not like it's not by a stretch. It's just like a step down. Uh, like, because those are so original and so fresh that even though some of his other films, like I love *Inglorious Bastards*, right. unapologetically, I absolutely love that film, and I love *The Hateful Eight. I can't tell you enough how much I think it's a fantastic masterpiece, and I think wow. see the entire three hours it goes by like that, and I cannot wait to see it again. So, I, I mean, that is such a great film. I absolutely love the Kill Bill. Everything he's done, really, I yeah. think is fantastic. So, but for me, the all-time killers for me is like. Reservoir Dogs because it was so fresh and original and fun and then the follow-up Pulp Fiction just was just insane so. There's really not other than death proof. There's really not a wrong answer. Yeah, there's really not a wrong answer to what is your favorite Quentin Tarantino He's put out so many good ones. So hey, hey death proof really holds up though If you put that into the exploitation category that's, that he made right, it as right that is oh, one of the I, best Exploitation but, but it, films this is what see. he was trying to do though. That's the thing like it's not for I understand everybody if you what he's trying to do yeah. But if you, if you try to you know bend over and take a crap on the lawn, it's still a pile of crap but I mean, If you do it in style do. though, yeah. I don't know that's, very the one I just, I just, that's the only thing Quentin Tarantino's ever done that I thought yeah. I thought he just swung and missed everything else has been a masterpiece All right, folks That'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great movies playing at our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Give you a little bit of a heads up. We're not going to have any movie talk on Thursday or Friday, being a little thing called Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So we're going to be taking those days off. Uh, But if you like this video, make sure you click the thumbs up button. Leave a comment in the comment section below. Let us know your thoughts. Add to the discussion on any or all the topics that we discussed here today. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And you can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives What Happened. It's that documentary now available for rental. Get it over the holidays at tdoslwh.com. And of course, sitting over here on my right, Mr. Christian Harloff, host of Jedi Council. Where can people find you? Well, Twitter and Instagram at Christian Harloff, but John mentioned Jedi Council. We have a really cool Jedi Council. It's going to be myself, John, John Schnepp, and Ken Knapsack. We will all be talking about spoiler heavy the force awakens so if you guys want to submit questions for that john you want to tell them how to do it yeah now normally we take your questions for jedi council via twitter by just tweeting out a question with the hashtag collider jedi council but because we're asking for spoilerific questions we don't want you to sully your twitter feed with putting spoilers out so what we're going to have you do is you got questions spoiler filled questions that you would like to ask if you've seen star wars force awakens you want to send them in email them to us at collidervideo at gmail.com and put in the subject line jedi council spoilers once again email your questions for collider jedi council the spoiler filled episode and let your friends know about this too but email them to us at Collider Video and put in the subject line 
Collider Jedi Council, and that's how you can get your question on this uh, this week's show. John, I forgot to mention Collider Heroes is on tomorrow. So if you want to tweet out, just tweet hashtag Collider Heroes. Any questions for tomorrow? And uh, put all the Star Wars spoilers you want in that one. No, that's right. No, just, just kidding. Just Don't kidding. do that, please. And of course, our lovely host today, Miss Natasha Martinez. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I'm being told. No, it's not Natasha. It is Ashley Mova. Am I going to stand here for three minutes? Ashley, where can people find you? <laughs> on Twitter and on Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And of course, you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.